Hi, so nice to see you here. My name is Ritu Sharma, and I am welcoming you here on behalf of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I run a joint program here between the International Youth Foundation and CSIS on youth prosperity and security. Why would a place like CSIS, this is a hardcore security think tank, right? If you're not familiar with CSIS, they are the top security think tank in the world. And when I came over here, I was a little bit skeptical of being around a lot of former military and security buffs talking about youth entrepreneurship and youth development. But over the last six months, what I have found is that this is an institution that intuitively understands the importance of youth to our shared security in the future. When most of us think about young people, I'm looking at a young man from Iraq, we think about young people with guns, crime, drugs, violent extremism, we tend not to have a very good picture of youth. But what we need to keep in mind is that it is really less than 1% of young people that are perpetrating violence or turning to extremism. 99% of young people out there are dedicated to their education, to their economic opportunity, to stability and security. We need to focus on the 99%. What I'm trying to do here at CSIS is to create an awareness among security policymakers that we need to flip our thinking about youth. And rather than targeting, literally and figuratively, the few young people who are gone off the rails, we need to target the vast majority of young people who are the ones who have the solutions to bringing back their peers from the brink. You know, I, I've started to hang out with a lot of young people and had the privilege of meeting the current class of the Laureate Global Fellows who are amazing. You're gonna hear from them. And a lot of us who are older often say, yeah, we're young at heart, right? Well, the truth is, folks, is that we might be young at heart, but seriously, the rest of our parts are old, <laughs> okay? And we have a perspective. We absolutely have a unique perspective. We have more experience and we look back. But one thing that we can't do very well is design programs for young people. Young people should be designing programs for young people. And our role is to support them, to facilitate, to help them grow, but not to do it in their place. So we're going to get right to it. I want you to enjoy the afternoon. We're going to be hearing from six of the current Laureate Fellows about their incredible social enterprises. And it's an honor for me to introduce Teresa Buyon, who created Un Millón de Niños Lectores, One Million Readers, which is a social enterprise. Teresa engages parents, volunteers, and companies to build libraries in low-income communities in Peru with the goal of strengthening literacy and educational outcomes. Already, she has reached over 7,500 students 4,000 parents and 1,200 teachers. And she's only getting started. Teresa, please. So, good afternoon. I'm new talking in English, so I'm gonna do my best. Okay? Well, um, when I was little, my grandma used to read me a lot of books, a lot, before bedtime. That was really normal for me. One night, I discovered that my grandma was reading, but she was reading like this, upside down. 
She was an illiterate woman. I was only six years old then. So I asked, why, Grandma, why you don't understand what you read? Why you don't read, Grandma? And she answered with a lot of shame in her eyes. She said, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, but I didn't have the, the, didn't have the opportunity to study, to read like you do. You know, the next day, I decided to become the teacher of my grandma. So we learned to write and read together. And that changed my life forever. Um, seven years ago, I had the pleasure to meet um, these little children. He is Joel Ocaña. I remember him because, you know, in the low-income schools, uh, children don't talk, don't usually talk. But she was like jumping and talking, and I used to ask to the little children, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he answered, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an engineer, and if I have time, I want to be a soccer player. <laughs> he said that. I was really impressed. And I was really impressed of this information too. He was one of the five million children in Peru who don't understand what they read. So how is going to become a doctor, Joel, if he don't know or, or, or if he don't understand what he reads? How? But imagine this, not with nine years old, Imagine him with 40 years old. Imagine him talking with their children and answer that same, the same question that I did to my grandma, why? So that changed my life again, you know? And I realized that I had to do something. And we did. So, We decide to transform these places. This is a, a library of a school in Peru. We decide to transform these spaces in this. Yeah. This is a library of recycled materials and a lot of love, a lot. Yeah. A lot of love of the people that believe in this could happen in a little small school, a, a really small school. So a lot of love of the people like Joel Ocaña, mother, mother. She is in the middle of this picture working. She understood that a library, it's more than a library. A library, it's the, a place of hope where people can receive knowledge. And she understood that a library is the place where their, their children is gonna discover the entire world. So she inspired more parents and teachers and everybody decide to do the same for their children. So, the entire educated community began to, to talk about it and start to demand the rights for the children and for their families. And in two years passed, and the school of Yoel Ocaña became the first place of reading comprehension in a district, you know? And the, and the, fourth, the fourth place in reading comprehension of 3,000 schools, public schools in my country. 
So in that point, we said, can we do it more? Can we replicate the model? So we did. And, <laughs> and the story that began with a little boy now have impact more than 10,000 children in a national level in my country. And now it's a local policy. So our dream now is to reach 1 million re readers because by 2021. Because when that happens, my country is, is, is will to become an, a free country, you know, uh, where dreaming it's going to be possible. Thank you very much. Okay, now we've established that you really don't want to hear from me. So, <laughs> I will be very quick. Um, now I want to introduce another phenomenal young person. Luke Rogers founded Foster Focus in the UK to challenge the stigma that young people who grow up through the foster system in his country, to challenge the stigma that they tend to carry with them throughout their lives. He brings solutions for foster care policies and practices, and best practice incorporates the voices of the young people that he serves. In 2014, his initiative reached 1,000 children in care. Luke, please, the stage is yours. So my name's Luke Rogers, I'm from the UK, and I founded Foster Focus. Foster Focus works with children's organizations to create youth participation strategies. We do this to build organizations and keep them child-focused, but at the same time to bridge the gap between young people that are not in education, employment, or training from care in the UK. 6% of all children that leave care go to university. That's six times less likely than all children in the UK. 50% of the prison population and 50% of the homeless population are young people who have experienced care. And one third of all children are unemployed, not in education or training. I was classed as one of those young people. I was brought up in care after coming from a background of domestic abuse and violence. Brought into a world where I had 11 primary schools, 13 different foster placements, and each time I moved, I lost a part of who I was. Struggling to find out where I was going and what I wanted to do, I realized the system needed to change. At 15 years old, I found myself as unfosterable and homeless. I'd built a referral so big that people wouldn't want to look after me, they wouldn't want to care for me, and I didn't feel loved. But I wasn't alone. This was the same for a lot of young people. When I was homeless at 15 years old, I was living on the trains, and I was still going to school doing my GCSEs. I had aspirations to become a social worker to make a difference in the world for all the young people that uh, were going through the same things that I was going through. I managed to get my GCSEs. I managed to go to college, get my A-levels, and I was looking at going to university. And I started speaking to more social workers about the system, about what was going wrong, about what we could change. And the more and more I spoke to social workers, the less and less I wanted to be one. I found that the system works in a way that is actually counterproductive to children in care. In England, our system is based on policy and procedure. We're really risk averse. We tell foster carers not to hug children, just in case they make an accusation of that foster carer. We protect professionals, and we don't listen to young people. And the more I explored and asked why, I was, called, I was told because we didn't think young people were articulate or intelligent enough to stand here right now and present to an audience of people about their experiences and share ideas about how services should change. When I started to work in the sector, I realized that consultation with young people was tokenistic. And I'll give you a very clear example. 
I was asked to do a health and fitness um, training day one day for young people, and the prizes for the quiz were chocolates and sweets. <laughs> and that's how we engage with young people. We brought them to meetings, we gave them pieces of paper, and we asked them to write down how they felt about their foster carers while their foster carers were sat there with them. This was not a true representation of what young people felt. So I started to ask why young people were carrying these stigmas and why young people were carrying these labels, because it's a very common thing which we all talk about. But the thing is, is nobody really knows how to challenge it. Because the stigmas, the statistics, make society think that young people are this certain group that are marginalized. Those statistics and stigmas make us think that those young people won't achieve, therefore we behave in that way. And if we behave in that way towards young people, how can we expect them to achieve if we believe that they're going to fail? Now we create youth participation strategies and one of the things that we do is we look at a young person's referral. Now I'll make this very simple. A social worker is fully responsible for a child, to build a relationship with a child, to take care of that child, but they're only expected to see the child once every six weeks. The foster carers are not given the full responsibility for the children in care for the reason that I've already given you. So what happens is social workers in the UK are constantly responding to crisis. They're constantly traveling from home to home when things are going wrong. And we blame the children for their behavior. We don't look beyond the labels. We've put them in a system that originally they did not want to be in, and we're asking them to appreciate something that they do not want. And not only that, but each time they travel to a new placement or a meet a new person, they have to re-speak about what they've been through, which re-traumatizes children every time they speak about their experiences. And re-traumatizing children isn't as bad as children that don't get traumatized when they speak about it. Because children that are so used to speaking about their experiences and feel no emotion, we've already lost them. I want to show you my referral at the age of 14 years old, 15 years old, when I was classed as unfosterable. I want to explain to you what we do at Foster Focus. So a referral form is what a young person carries around with them everywhere. And it just lists their behaviors. It just lists their traits. When they give the referral form to a foster carer, the foster carer makes an assessment whether they will or will not look after that child based on what's written in it. What is not on that referral form is how that young person feels, thinks, or their voice. So I'm going to read out my referral. I'm going to read out my perception of that referral. Luke is at high risk of running away. Luke was late home, and his foster care has reported him missing. A persistent young offender with offenses including burglary and assault. Luke took his PlayStation from his dad's house, and he attacked him in the street. Low attendance at school and is disengaged with other pupils. I had been to 11 primary schools and I always felt like I was losing friends. Luke has issues with attachment. My parents left me from a young age and I found it hard to find a foster family. We are seeking psychological assessment for Luke as he isolates himself in his room. I hide in my room because everybody keeps reminding me my stepdad beat me. Hard to build rapport with Luke as he can be seen as guarded and closed. I didn't feel like anybody would ever love me. Luke is an underachiever. Well, actually, Luke's no more than a social entrepreneur, so no one can to <laughs> So the trick is that to this, we can let our experiences define us or we choose to define our experiences. The way in which we reframe things, and the way in which we speak about things, and the way in which we choose to communicate about our young people despite the experiences they've had, will make a difference of how they think about themselves, how other people think about them, and how society think about them. 
If we can change the way social workers think about young people and foster carers think about young people and individuals think about young people, that will help young people build who they are. If we can change the way society think about young people, we will empower young people to change the world because they are part of our past, but 100% of our future. And I want to leave you with this. We cannot promise young people they are going to achieve what they want to achieve. We cannot promise young people they're going to do everything that they want to do. But what we can promise young people is if we help them find who they truly are, it's a million times better than anything they can ever imagine. And if you keep young people the heart of everything that you do, you'll give them the strength to put their heart in everything that they do. Thank you very much. That was very moving, Luke. Thank you. Um, and I have to say, as the mother of two boys, um, the mother in me loves the child in you, Luke. You're a brave young man, so thank you for that. I want to introduce to you now Nafula Wafula. He, she is a remarkable, vibrant young woman who founded the SEMA initiative in Kenya to help youth organize their own power to combat gender-based violence. She trains youth and leads workshops, different events, as well as GBB help desks in her community. And she's engaged more than 4,000 young people in not just dealing with gender-based violence, but in preventing gender-based violence. Nafula, please. I'll begin with a question. How many people in this room have nieces, sisters, daughters, our female loved ones between the ages of 15 and 19? Please put up your hand. Thank you. Now imagine living in a reality where chances are that one in four of them will lose their virginity by force. This is the reality that I live in. One in four Kenyan girls between the ages of 15 and 19 lose their virginity by force. And 46% of women in Kenya report at least one incidence of sexual abuse as a child. The reality is that, as a young woman, I have grown to embrace two emotions above all else, fear and shame. The reality is that one in three women will experience gender-based violence in their lifetime. Now, these were just numbers for me, statistics, things that I read in books as a young feminist until I ended up becoming a statistic, until someone decided that my consent was not worth asking for. Two years ago, I decided that I wanted a different reality. I decided that I want to be a rebel. My name is Nafula Wafula. I work for an organization called Servant Forge, and I am trying to find the clicker. <laughs> Thank you. I work for an organization called Servant Forge, where I run a program called SEMA. SEMA is a Swahili word, meaning speak out, so we're all going to learn some Swahili today. So I'd like you to say after me, SEMA. SEMA. Exactly. Swahili word meaning speak out. We are a youth-targeted gender-based violence initiative that seeks to create mentality change, behavior change, policy, and structural change, and break the cycle of gender-based violence in Kenya. How do we do this? We have different approaches. We have awareness raising and training and attitude change. In order to do this, we have the SEMA mentorship program, where we link up university students to high school students from low income areas for one year of one-on-one -on -one mentorship. This gives the children confidence. This gives the children self-esteem. We address gender stereotypes. We address gender-based violence, self-esteem issues in the curriculums. We also have the high school awareness program. We work with, with an organization called Kenya Scouts Association. This allows us to reach 500,000 youth across the country. And we run awareness training programs in the clubs themselves. Secondly, we have advocacy and activism. We have the Talking Walls Project, which is basically um, 
a project we have within campuses as well. So based, with the Talking Walls project, what we try and do is we work with university students in order to change their mentalities and perceptions. We work with university students so that they can create gender policies within the campuses. A lot of the universities in Kenya don't have gender policies, meaning if I am assaulted in a university campus, I don't know where to report, I don't know what to do. If I want to be a student leader in a university campus, it is difficult for me if I'm a female because the male student will be selected first. So we try and create this change and show young people that they can create an influence within their campus and eventually at a national and regional level. We also have activism. Recently, we targeted two companies that were running very sexist advertising um, in Kenya. And after a lot of action and speaking out and advocacy and numerous phone calls, they, were able, they took down all the advertisements, all the billboards, and they made a public apology. That was huge for us and the young people that we work with. We have advocacy and activism. One, we have the activism forums. Activism is two things, art and activism. When we match them, we have amazing forums in within which we have spoken word, band music, and a panel discussion on a topic on gender-based violence. All this is handled by young people. So they discuss gender-based violence, they discuss issues affecting them, and they come out of there with an action plan. What is it that they're going to do within a single month? We have a different one every month. So you can imagine the kind of impact that we are creating with young people. We also have the Talking Walls pro project in the slums in Nairobi. We paint murals with street graffiti artists where we give people information on where they can access services, what they can do, where they can report, and basically enable them to have a voice through art. Lastly, we have the access to vital services. Only one out of five survivors in Kenya report gender-based violence. Only one out of five women who are assaulted will report it. In order to do this, we try and bridge the gap and create access to services. We have an app for reporting gender-based violence. It's called the SEMA app. It is a GPS-coded app that allows a person to reach three important people and, and to reach emergency service providers in case they're in trouble. We also have the community justice centers. We are currently training 18 young people from the slums in Nairobi as paralegals and as counselors. And we're going to set up offices in libraries in slums where young people can go and report gender-based violence and not be afraid and be able to be given referrals and counseling and have their cases followed through. So far, we have reached over 5,000 young people through our project. We have brought down two campaigns with sexist messaging, and we have 18 young people trained as paralegals. So we will reach 18 different slums in Nairobi. We believe in a world that is free of gender-based violence. We believe in the power of young people. We believe that young people have a voice, and all they need to do is find that voice and recognize the power that it has and use it. We believe that everybody deserves to live a dignified life. And we invite you to join us, to work with us, to be a rebel and create a new reality. Thank you. hear more from our young social entrepreneurs, I promise you that. Um, what I want to introduce to you now another remarkable, remarkable leader who started his journey when he was young. He's still young, so I'm sure he started when he was really young. Ashok Regmi is the director of social entrepreneurship at the International Youth Foundation. And in case you didn't notice on all the banners outside, this is the 15th anniversary of the Youth Action Net. Ashok has been with that program from the very, very beginning and has grown it into an incredible network of universities and young people around the world. He works day in and day out to empower young social entrepreneurs and to strengthen their ventures around the world. When a young person goes through the IYF Youth Action Net, and in particular the Laureate International Fellows Program, it is not the end when they finish their workshop like they have done this week. It is the beginning of what 
It is the beginning of a process of strengthening their leadership. Now I have to vamp because the shook is leaving me. Okay, all right. He's going to use the podium. It is the beginning of us a new support network for them. I've talked to a lot of fellows, actually some former fellows in the last few weeks, but also the current fellows. And one of the things that's been so wonderful is that they all keep in touch. And not just on an occasional basis, they're on WhatsApp literally all the time, talking to each other, giving each other advice, talking about what's going on in their lives. So this is the beginning of them having an incredible support network. And that is all thanks to the work of IYF and Ashok. Well, thank you, Ritu, for such a generous introduction. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for CSI for hosting us. And I should just actually not speak at all after those three talks. I think we should change the entire program uh, for this afternoon. Um, it has been a pleasure for me since I started working at IYF to be leading this program and expanding it in multiple countries. And I've had also the pleasure and honor of developing a partnership with an, another amazing organization called Laureate International Universities, an organization which knows about uh, um, youth development, youth education pretty well. Um, I have two little daughters, Shreya, five, uh, Isha, three. And they're beautiful girls, but they fight a lot. <laughs> they can be rambunctious. And what I have realized is whenever they fight or give a hard time with, to each other, if I shout at them, if I say, you're a bad girl, don't do that, that strategy never works, never. And all the parents sitting here are nodding their head. As, as much as you shout, it's not going to work. But when I tell them, you're a good girl, you're a good sister, it always works. And for me, that is so powerful. And if you look at it 15 years ago when we started this program, that's exactly the philosophy that IYF used, which is look at the good things in young people and use that to bring the best in them. A program that was started to support 20 young social entrepreneurs like themselves, 15 years fast forward, 1,300 young social entrepreneurs like them around the world from 90 different countries and we have a network of 22 national and regional programs around the world who are supporting young people in their own countries, bound by a common framework of what leadership development is about, but fundamentally believing in the power of young people. So I just want to share just quickly five insights of what we have found out from our work. One, youth are uniquely equipped to change the world. They're just passionate. They don't sit there and think. They just do it. They have passion. They have commitment. They are, fle they are flexible. They are thinking new ways. They are disruptive. And that needs to be celebrated. It's a trust factor that we need to have for them. They are using multiple strategies, multiple modalities for change, using arts for change, changing in education sector, nonprofit modality, for-profit, hybrid, registered organization, not registered, working within an organization, outside the organization. But we also found out that our system has to do a lot of catch up. We are not set in a way to support these multiple modalities of young people. So as a system, we need to think about that. These young social entrepreneurs and young people learn very differently. We have found out that it's important to give them frameworks, but let them figure out how their failures and successes fit within that framework. They believe in application, less on theories. And a lot of times, we teach them in linear ways. And it does no good to teach them in linear ways in a nonlinear world. Our problems are complex. Our societies are nonlinear. So we need to think about how we can adapt our learning methodologies in order to adapt to this change of this generation. Third one, change making is very contagious. Our fellows together have, are working with hundreds of thousands of 
volunteers. University students are looking for entrepreneurial mindset for social change. They want to connect their skills with their passion. We as a society need to come up with an effective methodology to capitalize in, on this movement. Fourth, I only have five, okay? Um, and we believe after 15 years of work that global change starts with local ownership. Long gone are those days when you would take a model from up here and try to replicate in multiple countries. World has changed. We need to look, go in the grassroots innovations and see people who are closest to the problems, how they are developing solutions. Luke knows what an issue a foster care system is. Nafula knows what gender-based violence in Kenya looks like. As a society, we need to have a complete paradigm shift on how we look at development. And the last one I would say, young people ask very different questions. You see, I've, I've felt that international development for, or any other sector, the world as it exists now, we are focused on asking, are we doing the things right? Instead of asking, are we, do the, are we doing the right things? It's a different mindset. It's a different mentality. And for, this, for answering the second question, are we doing the right things, we need to bring empathy in development. We need to look at, be at somebody else's shoes and see how they see the world. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in just incremental changes. We will never have transformational change. And young people who we support around the world, 1,390 countries, 22 institutes, every time they are the ones who are asking the second question, are we doing the right things? And we may call it idealism. I say maybe they are reminding us what we have forgotten as a society. So I applaud. Thank you. There's a wonderful saying which should be on the walls at USAID. Only the one wearing the shoe knows how comfortable it is. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there walking around in very uncomfortable shoes. All right, we are going to go into our breakout sessions. We have two sessions that we will divide ourselves into. One is on young people as catalysts for change, opportunities, and challenges. I want to under, underline the challenges piece of this because I think that they're amazing. They're amazing. They make it all look so easy. It's not. It's not easy. So we really want to explore the hard parts of this. The second is about the university systems as a hub for youth social innovation. This piece is so critical for scaling up what needs to happen on youth social entrepreneurships. We need to have universities that get it. The session on catalysts for change, opportunities and challenges will be in this room. The other session on university systems will be just next door. So I want to invite you, we're not, this is not a coffee break, okay? We will have a coffee break after the plenary sessions. So if you would please, uh, Get a cup of iced tea really quickly, come back. We want to try to start these sessions on time. And your incentive for this is that we do not want to run out of time to hear from three more young social entrepreneurs. <laughs>